I greet you once again, my brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to be continuing on the theme of truth, as we brought out before in John chapter 18, the uh, ruler, Roman ruler of Israel, Pontius Pilate, realized that Jesus Christ was only delivered up because of the envy of the Jewish people. But yet they called him a king, and so he went to Christ, and he spoke that, are you a king? And Christ at that time said, made it very clear that he is no harm to the Roman Empire. My kingdom, he said, is not of this world. Now that's going to be new and incredible statement for Christ to make because when he was prophesied in the Old Testament to be very much a king of this world. He will rule over the whole world in and through Israel. And all nations will become subservient to him. And But now he's saying, my kingdom is not of this world. If it was, my subject would fight, but they're not fighting. Well, then Pilate said, well, you are a king then. And Christ said, yes, I'm a king. Um, for this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world. Now we're going to get the facts. What is the purpose of his coming? For this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world, that I might bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. That's one of the most amazing statements you're going to find in the Bible. It's so beautiful. It's so clear. It's so simple. Why is it so profound? Because the whole world is submerged in darkness and ruled under the leadership of the father of lies and the propagator of lies. And of course, Pilate himself, what's truth? How about our day in politics? How many people here would like to define truth in the United States? Who should I vote for? Or what should I vote for? It, you talk about chaos. It's unbelievable. And in other parts of the world, it's no different. Take the Soviet Union, for instance, where Putin has obviously bought his way into his, a repeat of his six-year term of office. Is, is there truth in that election? Was it Democrat? Ah, yes. Yeah, he just put to death anybody who opposed him. Just that simple. Where is truth? Where is truth? And yet here's a man who came for no other purpose than to reveal Truth, truth, truth. That seems like the invisible thing that always evaporates. You can't get a hold of it. You can't find it. What is it really? Well, it is beautiful there, and it's in reality because every individual who came to Christ had a change in their life, change in their heart attitude, and they could walk in truth, in reality, as God wanted them to walk in the midst of this terrible kingdom. So the kingdom that Christ is going to set up is going to, you can easily call it from there, a kingdom of truth. And its subjects are those who hear the truth, recognize the truth, and walk in the truth. And in that manner, be a living, vital testimony to the world that Jesus Christ is indeed the truth, that he's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life for all mankind. So it's an amazing statement. Some preachers and some teachers hesitate to say that the uh, church is a kingdom, but it is. And it's not the only time. Pilate wasn't really the first one who was told that there is a change here. Christ said to Pilate, but now my kingdom is not from here. Now, what do you mean? Is a change? Yes, there was a change. He was the promised king of the Jews. He was the promised one to sit on David's throne. He was the promised one to rule over the whole world. But now, I'm no longer from on that vein. Now I'm going to be ruling 
and all those who hear and love the truth will hear my voice, respect my voice. Well, God will also, Christ promised his disciples before he died, the Last Supper, that he would send the Holy Spirit, and he, three times he referred to him, the Spirit of Truth, the Spirit of Truth, the Spirit of John 14, 15, and 16. So the Holy Spirit primarily is going to be ministering truth, regenerative truth, living truth, and a hope in the truth of Christ coming for us to take us out of this particular world. But I say again, that's not the first time Christ indicated a change that's coming. Actually, the Gospel of John is unique in that respect. And the very first conversation we're introduced to in John is John, the third chapter. And that's where Christ is talking to a man who's the member of the Sanhedrin, Nicodemus. And he almost as blunt in saying it. Nicodemus had started that conversation. Uh, we know that you're a man from God. No one can do the miracles you've done. We know unless God is with him. Now, that was a giveaway. Nicodemus didn't say, I know. He said, we know. Well, that meant <laughs> the head of Sanhedrin knew too, but they weren't interested in the truth because there's another aspect of truth that is dangerous to those who hate the truth. Some people will say that they'd hate the truth. Why? Because it exposes them. They hate the truth because they are children of lies. They don't love, they love the lie instead of the truth. But anyway, he told Nicodemus, except you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, what kingdom is he talking about? Was he thereby talking about the kingdom that Nicodemus anticipated, the messianic kingdom? It is a fact that everyone who goes into that kingdom, only saved people will go into that kingdom. Because at the beginning of it, there'll be a judgment. The lost will be cast out and the righteous will go into the kingdom. So only saved people will initially enter the kingdom. Well, but that kingdom is 1,000 years long. What happens by the end of it? Shockingly, the nations of earth will revolt against Christ. And the armies will come up against Jerusalem. And that's when God calls down fire. What does that mean? That means during that time, Many people will have a built-up resentment to Christ. And when Lucifer is released at the end of that time period, their true colors will show up and they'll rebel against the king. So not everyone in that kingdom is born again. Well, that means when Christ told Nicodemus, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's not the messianic kingdom he's talking about. It's a kingdom that Nicodemus himself would enter into after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Because only saved people are in the kingdom that God has set up for this age, the spiritual kingdom kingdom that makes you, you understand and you know truth, you've obeyed it, you're born again into that kingdom. Saved you to it. Some think, well, this could be, maybe it's the, it's the eternal kingdom. It's always existed. Uh, is that the kingdom Christ is talking about? No, because saved and unsaved people are in that. No matter how much the world rebels, God always has control of all things. And he will only allow Lucifer, so much latitude, and then he'll stop it. So he's king over all, and there are saved and unsaved there in that kingdom under his control. Of course, the final aspect of that kingdom is where all sin will be isolated out 
and separated into the lake of fire. And only the righteous will be in the new heaven and the new earth. But the kingdom today is only composed of saved, regenerate people. Now, in the Gospel of Luke, there's another occasion, a third occasion, where the subject of the kingdom is brought up and where Christ indicates a change. And this is Luke 17. He's the last trip he's taking back to Jerusalem. And he's asked on the way by the Pharisees. Now when he was, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, and this must have befuddled them because they're all expecting the kingdom of God. And I mean, it's the promised king who will smite the nations of the earth and set up the messianic rule over all nations on the earth and he'll be supreme ruling over the world from Jerusalem. And he answers, when, he, when is it going to come? He says, the kingdom does not come with observation. Huh? Well, that's not, ain't the one they're expecting then, because the one they're expecting is to come with outward cataclysm. And Christ will say that just a few verses later. Look at verse 24. He says, as a lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man shall be in his day. Everybody going to see that? You bet you're going to see that. He's coming in flaming fire. If they can see that, yes, the world, it says, will see that. But then Christ added, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. That's why he told the Pharisees the kingdom he's talking about doesn't come with observation. How's it come? Nor will they say, See here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Amazing truth. This kingdom that God has set up today is inward. It's spiritual realities. God doesn't change the political system for us. God changes our hearts and he aligns us with righteousness goodness and grace in this world. He gives us a new outlook totally on life. And no matter where, the, where we are, the kingdom of God today includes every nation on the face of this earth, individuals in every nation. All saints in Africa are members of this kingdom. All saints in South America are members of this kingdom. All saints in the United States and North America, Russia, Asia, wherever it may be, Individuals who turn their hearts and their lives to Jesus Christ, they're born again and they're put into that kingdom. That's an amazing thing. And the day's coming, don't you know it, when we're going to rejoice when we get to hear the singing of saints from South America and Spanish and Africa, the various nations in Africa and, and Asia, and those who suffered in other places, even in Arab countries who turned to the Lord, all of them will be a part of the called out company of people, members of Christ's kingdom today. That, that, so I say again, and then uh, you may remember that even the apostles on the day of uh, first chapter of Acts, they asked the question themselves. Uh, this is Acts chapter one, uh, verse four, being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. Therefore, when he had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? N and there again, you see, they didn't realize or know fully about the church, which is Christ's body. It was a mystery from them. Nicodemus didn't know it, but Christ told him. Uh, actually, the woman at the well was another one that Christ informed 
that the day is coming when true worshipers won't be worshiping in a grand cathedral. They won't be worshiping in a grand temple. They won't be worshiping through fantastic rituals. They'll be worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Truth. You mean in reality of heart, in reality of consciousness, and in simplicity to God. God is a spirit, and they who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amazing as it may seem. So this is a unique kingdom that they didn't know before, but that is descriptive of the church. Now, I think some people don't like to refer to the church as a kingdom uh, for two reasons. The first reason is they don't want it confused with the Davidic kingdom, which, of course, in religion, the Roman Catholic Church says, yes, the church is a kingdom, and we've got the authority because we're it. And they've got pomp and ceremony, and they imitate the Roman uh, emperors and the names, titles, and ritual system. Fantastic. And they do everything Christ said the kingdom was not. They'll rule through rituals, outward glamour. <laughs> you see the popes come and go. And, of course, a lot of it is absolute foolishness and stupidity. I think one of the most colossal things that happened at the Vatican happened when Pope Pius XII died. Yeah, he was the one who was not going to open and say anything publicly when he knew the Holocaust was going on. He knew it carefully. He, he, was, he was a fanatic in some respects. He didn't like medical doctors, the medical world, and he made it very clear when he dies, there will be no embalming of this body. You're going to take me and put me in the tomb, grave, you know? And so when he died, <clears throat> there was really confusion. The doctors said, we got to get this man up <laughs> to display quickly because, you know, <laughs> and, but it was, and there was arguments about what to do, what not to do. We got, so they sprayed him and they did everything. And it was nine days later <laughs> before they paraded him down the streets and into the Vatican. <laughs> oh into that holy sanctuary. <laughs> and along the way, you could hear uh, little minor explosions of gas. <laughs> I mean, and it, it was published. It was in cameras. And they posted him on the steps. And of course, those tall uh, Swiss guards were standing there. One of them went, bam, fell flat on the floor. <laughs> And quickly they came up and pumping <laughs> perfume all over that casket. You talk about a, a, a hideous mockery of what's going on. The greatest stink ever been <laughs> clouded that place. Well, anyway, that that is that's so such a hideous mistake. They wished that had never had a problem like that before. Well, that's the kind of religion God is not at all concerned with. That's Calamities that come because of man's own religious, superficial religiosity that, that is utter nonsense. Uh, it, it's, it's climactic for sure. At any rate, that's not the kingdom we are in. The kingdom we are in is spiritual, it's inward, it's glorious. It's not going to have any of the uh, paraphernalia. We don't have diamond crowns, we don't have high colorful gowns, we don't have all this ritual sanctification that people just moan and groan over. Uh, we've got the realities of Jesus Christ for us today. But Christ told them uh, when they said, are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Now, not to know meant they're not to realize when that's going to happen. They knew all about what the prophet said would be precursor to that kingdom being set up. And so they knew what to expect when it was to come. And there was quite a bit of stir, by the way, during that first 40 years of the church because they knew that Rome, in a sense, was uh, a great dynamic power and uh, it was the calamity that was coming on Israel was really coming quick. 
but that was coming because of their national rejection of their Messiah. And uh, it's, however, with a little precursor to what the prophet said would happen in our day, the final form of the Roman government will be Mr. Antichrist will rule. And the first thing, he, one of the first things he'll do, or one thing they will do, is destroy the Roman religious kingship and rulership. And that's going to be a great, great day. Uh, Revelation chapter 17 and chapter 18 characterizes that. Christ said, you're not going to know. You simply, you shall receive now, this is interesting. Verse 8 of Acts 1. But you shall receive authority, power, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That's going to be the main program that God is going to be concerned with and was concerned with with the foundation of church. It is a fact that there was a re-offer of the kingdom to Israel on the resurrection side of the cross because they still did not fully know what this new kingdom of which Christ was speaking about really consisted of. It would come gradually. So they offered the old king. They didn't know, they didn't have yet the promise of the rapture of the church. That was not revealed until Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians, probably in the year 50 AD. That was 20 years after Christ's death and the establishment of the church of Jesus Christ. And then shortly other, 1 Corinthians 15, which goes into the subject in great detail of the resurrection of the saints of this age and the glorious rapture of the church when all will be saved and, and changed and be sent into heaven. Then scattered throughout Paul's epistles are numerous expressions that refer to and include the rapture, though it doesn't directly state it as such. It's related to it. I've collected about 75 different references in Paul's letters and epistles, and some in what we call the Jewish epistles, Peter, John, that do have reference to the rapture of the church or would relate to it. And, and not one of them, is there any indication whatsoever of any physical phenomena that must precede the rapture of the church? It's not coming with a, 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 something that precedes it to give away the date or the time or the hour of it. I made a mistake some years ago thinking that there was one. And uh, I'll discuss that with you as well as we go all along in these studies. But at any rate, the church of Jesus Christ is going up at a time without a precursor. Now, there was the alertness that the Apostle Paul gave in 1 Thessalonians to tell us that the rapture will be in close proximity to the great and terrible day of the Lord. And so we know when we see the stage being set for that world calamity that the rapture is near. And I think as far as I can see in the news items and in the religious broadcasting, I think there are Christian preachers all over this world who are anticipating now as never before the imminency, the closeness of that time coming. There's too many world events that have changed drastically. And it's interesting, you can make a collection. Uh, I did back in the early uh, 50s and 60s. Earlier, uh, when Israel became a nation, boy, the whole doors were open to that subject of the rapture of the church. Because why? Well, because Matthew, Mark, Luke make it very clear that Israel will be a nation again at the time of the second coming of Christ. And Jerusalem will be the headquarters of the nation. And there will even be a temple reestablished. And when the nation was reestablished in the Jewish language and the Jewish star, the Jewish philosophy, and the Jewish Bible was once again put on the podium as uh, implementation of this new kingdom, 
of our Israel, the nation of Israel, the lights went on again, and the Bible believers said, hey, look at that. With stages now being set, and of course, many things have transpired since then, and much, many more, Israel now has custody of Jerusalem. They didn't have for many years. Now there's talk of the rebuilding of the temple. Now the news items is the Jews have the, 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 the proper breed of red heifer that is needed for purification before they can do any building of anything. Uh, the red heifer, according to the law of Moses, was a particular cow that had never been harnessed, not been, never been used. It must be within a three-year-old animal, a young animal, and it, it uh, must be pure red, and it will be taken outside the camp and sacrificed, and the ashes will be gathered together. And anything that's unclean, be it a building, be it furniture, or be it a person who is contaminated in any way, can have the ashes mixed with running water and that sprinkled upon those objects, and they will be purified in the sight of God. And thus they recognize and have always recognized they can never rebuild that temple until the whole mountaintop, as it were, is purified again with the ashes of the heifer. They've now got the heifer. They've now got a, actually a small herd of them. And they also now have a political rulership in Israel that is more in submission to the religious call of Israel. And they're tolerant of the sacrifice. It's just, when are they going to do it? That's interesting. Well, well, anyway, we see the road and the pathway building up very carefully to Israel. Israel's coming and, and that, that rain. But those verses show that the church of Jesus Christ is a kingdom. When we think of a kingdom, we think of authority. We think of, of, of a military. Well, but the military that God described for us, Timothy was to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. What well, did that mean? He had a uniform? No. Did he have a bayonet? No. What's he got? He's got the sword of the Spirit. He's got the Word of God. All of us are in God's army. And we got all the, we got the girdle and we've got the helmet of salvation. We've got the sword of the Spirit. We've got the, 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 the sandals of the preparation of the gospel of peace. We've got the uniform. So, yes, we have an art, but it's spiritual. Yes, there is rulership. There is order for this institution. And when we think of the kingdom, there's going to be proper judgment and discipline in the kingdom. But today it's spiritual. There's a proper place for spiritual church judgment and discipline that is to be administered to disorderly conduct. And by the way, the first letter Paul writes and the second letter he writes, he calls for discipline for disorderly Christians. And guess what? It's the same word used in the military of Israel and of the world. It's disorderly conduct. Anybody who's been in the army knows what disorderly conduct was. And we didn't want to get that. It really puts a good, bad name on it. So there is disorderly conduct in the church with Jesus Christ. Well, how do you, there's a godly way to deal with it, a proper biblical way to deal with it. And what type of conduct is it? In fact, you know, in, in the world we live in today, I think the one thing I've, when I've been into courtrooms, the one thing I see that people anticipate would hope, oh, I wish we had some honest lawyers. I wish we had some honest judges. What a comfort it would be to know we can get good, godly judgment. Well, in the church, that's what it should be. When it's not, there's going to be serious problems. And of course, there is in this day, God said that this age would close with apostasy as well as the other time periods in God's domain. But anyway, we're, we got through that. I'm going to take up some other passages that have to do with this subject in the next program as well. But remember, the kingdom we're in, by God's majest grace, is a spiritual kingdom with spiritual loyalty and grace given to us on the basis of our allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven. 
we should have joyous delight in serving Christ the way he wants us to serve. We're not left to our imaginations. You can't get into the army and you set your rules down. They set the rules for you. They tell you how to dress. They tell you you step across that line and you're ours. You swear your allegiance to ours. Now, the same is true with God's army. We swear our allegiance, as it were, pledge our allegiance to him and to his grace for us. Okay, see you later, Lord willing.